Hello everyone and welcome to the seventh episode of the Knowledge Nest. Today is March 13th and we are going to start advertising for the next book club which is going to be on April 13th. So that is one month date wise exactly from today. So put that on your calendars. The next book club book is going to be The Giver of Stars. From the author of Me Before You, set in the Prussian era America, a breathtaking story of five extraordinary women and their remarkable journey through the mountains of Kentucky and beyond. Alice Wright marries handsome American Bennett Van Cleve, hoping to escape her stifling life in England. But small town Kentucky quickly proves equally claustrophobic, especially living alongside her overbearing father-in-law. So when a call goes out for a team of women to deliver books as part of Eleanor Roosevelt's new traveling library, Alice signs on enthusiastically. The leader, and soon Alice's greatest ally, is Marjorie, a smart-talking, self-sufficient woman who's never asked a man's permission for anything. They will be joined by three other singular women who become known as the Pack Horse Librarians of Kentucky. What happens to them? and to the men they love, becomes an unforgettable drama of loyalty, justice, humanity, and passion. These heroic women refuse to be cowed by men or by convention. And though they face all kinds of dangers in a landscape that is at times breathtakingly beautiful at others brutal, they're committed to their job. Bringing books to people who have never had any, arming them with facts that will change their lives. Based on a true story and rooted in America's past, The Giver of Stars is unparalleled in its scope and epic in its storytelling. Funny, heartbreaking, enthralling, it is destined to become a modern classic, a richly rewarding novel of women's friendship, of true love, and of what happens when we reach beyond our grasp for the great beyond. So this is the next book in our book club. Alison Beard chose this. It is one of the few books that I've come across that is about librarians as the main author. I'm sure there's more books, but it's one of the first that shows how librarians impact the world around them and how being a librarian can impact other people as well. It can impact the librarians themselves. It impacts those that are around. Being a librarian is about helping people have access to knowledge. This book is a vibrant and historically accurate portrayal of the importance of librarians to community and individual education. There are portrayals of librarians in many different types of creative works, from novels such as this one to comic books, movies, and even fine art. For example, The Librarian is an oil painting by Giuseppe Arcimboldo in the mid-16th century. The subject of this painting was probably Wolfgang Natzius, who was a librarian for the Holy Roman Emperors. Arcimboldo was an antecedent of the Surrealist painting style. He combined the relatively mainstream Mannerist form of painting, where subjects would sit and the artists would try to capture as much of the body as possible. So to do that, they distorted the body so that all parts of the body would be visible and most of the parts of the body would, would be visible, but the ways their body looks, the length of the arms or the stance would not be a normal or regular type of stance. And so they had kind of a strange manner about them. So that was called mannerist painting. And he combined that with images of fruits, vegetables, and other items. When he painted for the Habsburg Roman emperors, he developed the style of painting that used objects in place of parts of human heads. If you've ever seen the portraits of people and their faces and their heads or their bodies are made out of fruit or vegetables, that is our symbol, those paintings. He was a very accomplished painter and he was a precursor of the Surrealist movement. The Surrealist movement kind of grew out of appreciation for his art, but it grew in the 19th and 20th centuries. So he was very ahead of his time. And again, most of his objects that he used in place of human parts were fruits or vegetables or animals. But when he painted the librarian appropriately, he composed Lazius' head, body, and his headwear all out of books 
and papers. This artwork is very, very interesting. Of course, you can interpret it in many different ways. I looked at the painting to see if there was writing on the spines of these books to see kind of what books would be most important to Nazius, but I, they were all different types of books and I didn't see any writing on the spine. So interpret that how you will, but that is a very interesting painting. Other examples of portrayals in of, of librarians in pop culture and in culture in general uh, include The Librarian, the Librarian TV series and movie series, um, as well as in National Treasure, there's depictions of librarians, archives, a subtype of librarians. There's portrayals of archives in, in movies, usually when people are searching for, you know, hidden historical artifacts. But the point is, librarians are very important and they are portrayed in many different ways in many different cultural works. Marion the Librarian, of course, comes to mind, shushing people constantly, as we talked about, as I talked about with Ross a few episodes ago, and with Allison a little bit, but we are not like that. So, be careful that you don't believe exactly what people tell you about librarians or about anyone, really. But the point is, librarians have made such an impact that there are many different portrayals of them in culture. Coming back to the subject of the book for our next book club, pack horse librarians were almost exclusively women. There were some men, but they were virtually exclusively women who traveled around the American Midwest, mostly in Eastern Kentucky. And that's what a lot of people focus on is the pack horse librarians of Kentucky, specifically Eastern Kentucky. And they were functioning during the last half of the Great Depression and a short time after it ended. They ended around 1943, some people say 1945, but mostly around 1943. So it was a division of the Works Progress Administration, which if you know your New Deal history, focused on providing work and public services to local communities. They would hire people to create public services and public resources available to their neighborhoods or they would go usually relatively close to where they lived but they would go other places and provide services and resources to those people but these librarians worked out of central libraries that house books but they used the pack horses to deliver large amounts of books all across the area that typically wasn't reached by foot and that's why they used horses but books magazines newspapers were all delivered to people who couldn't make it to the physical library. Can you imagine? I mean, that would be, can you imagine the, the amount of time you could have in your book if it was delivered and picked up by someone on horseback? I'm sure they didn't have a two week return period on those books. The Pack Horse Library Project was one of the initiatives of Eleanor Roosevelt, as it stated in the book summary. She said, if the women are willing to do things because it's going to help their neighbors, I think we'll win out. And I know that her husband, President Roosevelt, said that about everyone in general as well. So the pack horse librarians really showed that they were willing to go to great personal sacrifice and discomfort, if you can imagine riding a pack horse for 20 miles, which was their average time. They were willing to sacrifice their comfort and their ease of living to go deliver books to other people. They're a great example to librarians all over the world of how we should be willing to distribute knowledge and distribute information resources to as many people who need it and desire it. One interesting thing that the Pack Horse librarians did was that they created scrapbooks from old books that were too old to reliably make the journey. Now, this is discouraged heavily today. We frown on things like that now because of copyright law, but they did that then. Copyright means that you cannot simply reproduce work created by others and distribute the products to others as if they were your own work without the original creator's permission. So if they wanted to make these things legal, they could contact the author by mail, I would imagine, during that time, 
and then the author would have to say, oh, okay, you can do it. And then they could make the scrapbook, but they didn't have time for that. They needed to get information out to people. So they just cut and pasted and made the scrapbook. Even when you do get their permission, the finished work is called an anthology, and you're referred to as an editor rather than an author. And copyright is constantly changing. I'm sure you've heard of Creative Commons licenses, which for better or worse, kind of removes many of the restrictions, virtually all of the restrictions of copyright on resource users. There are Creative Commons licenses that you all you have to do is give the name of the person who created the original work and say, this is derived from this resource and then include the license. Or you have to do that and then you can't use it for commercial purposes. But still, most other abilities restricted by regular copyright laws are allowed under Creative Commons copyright. So copyright is always changing. For questions about copyright and how it affects us today, ask me or ask the for Alec, our copyright librarian. All of this is to say, however, in the Great Depression and World War II times, they did not care as much about copyright infringement and they would not have done it much because they couldn't do much if they did care about it because they wouldn't know about it. Chances are that authors did not know that their works were being cut out and combined with those of other authors. In any case, over 2,500 scrapbooks were created. And these scrapbooks included information from all types of different sources, literature, local history, folk songs, recipes, encyclopedia articles, newspaper articles, all these different sources were combined into scrapbooks. And they would be hauled around by the pack horse librarian and they would be read to people or maybe they would drop them off. But later scrapbooks even incorporated sketches of quilt patterns so people could copy down the quilt patterns and quilt patterns were disseminated through these little scrapbooks. So these scrapbooks are actually held in various historical organizations and you can see kind of how information and data and ideas were spread by the Packhorse librarians. They didn't just have books there, they were a form of more or less mail carriers who carried the mail or carried ideas through on their horses from place to place. Sometimes the librarians would even incorporate reading lessons. So not only would they read the scrapbooks or leave it with people, they would teach people how to read for short periods of time or demonstrations. They would demonstrate how to read the books to those whom they delivered the books. So they served as teachers and librarians and postmasters of a sort. So far in this episode, I have combined literature, American history, women's history, fine art, and world history. How did I compile all of this information into a cohesive whole? Part of it is because I always love going down rabbit holes and this time I was happy to take you with me. The second thing is I simply researched and found the most accurate and authoritative source for the information I wanted to include. I got the book review from Goodreads and then I said, what's the main theme of this book? What are the main interesting subjects of this book? And then I did the same thing when I found out about the Pack Horse Librarian program. And then I added and added. And I made sure that I got this information from authoritative and accurate websites. What resources do we have that can give you information on a wide range of information, wide range of topics like this? On our front page, we have links to article databases, credo reference, and subject guides. In future episodes, I will go into detail about each of these types of research tools. We are dedicated to helping you find out as much information as possible. Our stated values, in fact, are responsiveness to patron needs, quality, effective, efficient, and courteous service, and providing access to quality information so resources. So we hope that you'll come in frequently and find many types of information and gain help. On that note, next week, we will discuss the many forms of help that are available to the library or help resources that we can assist you in acquiring for all sorts of needs, including emergency preparedness, practical help, personal needs, animal shelters, and many other needs. Please comment either 
in the YouTube channel or on the Anchor site, the Spotify site, or email me and tell me about a time that librarians helped you. How have librarians helped you in your life? And also comment, what books would you like to read? I've said in previous episodes, I'll read your books. I'll comment about them. I can do a little book review thing of my own on this podcast. I'm always willing to read suggestions and offer my opinions on them and engage in a conversation about literature or even nonfiction works. If you want to send those to me, I will read them. So thank you very much for watching this episode of The Knowledge Nest, and I'll see you next week.